So that said, let's, let's uh, do some preaching. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm ready to learn something today. <laughs> now do it again and mean it. All right, do it again. <laughs> Good grief, y'all. Come on now. All right. So um, there's an agitated patient. He, he's stomping around his psychiatrist's office, and he's, he's stomping around, running his hands through his hair. He's like almost in tears. He's like, you know, Doc, Doc. My, my memory's gone, man. He's like, I, I can't remember my wife's name. I can't remember my kids' names. I, I can't remember what kind of car I drove here. I don't even remember where I, where I work. I mean, it was, it was all I can do to just find my, my way here, man. And the doc says, Marty, you got to calm down. How long have you been like this? And he looked, and he thought about it for a second, and he said, how long have I been like what? <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the humoring. Uh, of your preacher right here. All right. Hey, there is nothing, and I need an amen from those of you who got some gray hair in the room, all right? There is nothing more frustrating than being able to remember something. Amen? amen. I mean, oh my goodness, there is very little that more frustrating for me. It's like, why did I walk into this room? Why did I go to the store? You know, who am I? You know, th those kind of things. It's like, what it is, it's like I heard somebody once said, they're like, I always have trouble remembering three things, uh, faces, names, and I can't remember what the third thing is, all right? And so I, we, for, it's frustrating to not know and to not be able to remember something. But here's a question for you. What if you were unable to remember who you were? It was a couple decades ago that there was a, a, a headline in the Chicago Tribune, and this is what it said. It said, living a life unknown. And the subheading said this, dozens of John and Jane Doe's turn up yearly at Illinois police stations and hospitals. Most are identified. These five weren't. And it goes on to tell the stories of several of them, and some of them have names. Um, one's name was Robert Rockefeller, the other Shannon Knight, and others just had the name of anonymity, you know, John or Jane Doe. But the deal is, is nobody knew who they were. But sometimes the identity would be discovered. There was a man that they had named uh, Carlos, and he had been awarded the state since 1998, and he'd been there longer than any of the other John Doe's in Illinois. And according to the Tribune, he, he doesn't speak and likely had a stroke that caused brain damage. He uses a wheelchair, and he wears a medical helmet to prevent injuries. His only reaction to people is a wide smile and a giddy giggle. Well, on November 29th in the year 2011, the staff at the care facility where he was, they discovered his identity. And they also discovered that it was his 53rd birthday that day. And according to the story, that day his caretaker went up to Carlos and uttered the name Crispin Moreno. And the usually giggly man fell silent after hearing his real name for the first time in 13 years. And then tears began to run down his cheeks. Can you imagine what it would be like to live life not knowing who you are? Wandering around, not for sure what your name is, uncertain of who you are, but here's what I fear, that there are many of us watching online and many of us sitting here in this room today doing and living just like that. Many of us have a condition too. It just doesn't make the headlines. It doesn't make sto a great story like Crispin's did, but it's just as real because we are continually forgetting one of two things, who we are or we are living unaware of who we are, causing us to, to walk around, search for our identity, and asking one of life's most important questions, who am I? It's fundamental to our existence, isn't it? This is why our teenage years are so difficult. It's why whenever we look back at our yearbook pictures and we see the haircuts and the clothes that we were wearing, we're ashamed. Because we look at that and we're like, oh my goodness, what was I thinking? And what were you thinking in that moment is, who am I? Who am I? Who am I going to become? It's why we have a phrase that we call the midlife crisis. 
What happens in the midlife crisis? It, it happens because men and women, they reach a certain age and they realize that they're at halftime in the game and there might be less time left than what they've already lived. And they start to ask questions like, who am I? What am I doing? What have I done? Where am I going? And we generally try to answer it with bleached hair and a sports car. Hey, that, that's what we try to do. It's why retirement is so difficult for so many people. Because for years and years and years and decade upon decade, your entire identity has been wrapped around who or what it is that you do. And then whenever that time comes and it's time for you to step away and someone else is to step into your role, you begin to wonder, who am I really? We try to find our answers with just about anything. I mean, sometimes we turn to politics. And it's like, as long as my party or my politician is in the office, then, then everything is good. But the moment he's not, oh my goodness, I don't know who I am. It's why we turn to things like our relationships. It's why we turn to things like our work and we find our identity in that. It's why some of you try to find your identity in your, sexual, in your sexuality. But the problem with all of those things is that they never satisfy. They don't take you where you really want to go. And eventually, every single one of those things is going to let you down. Because I got news for you. Your politician is not always going to be in office. You're not always going to be the person you are at work. Somebody else will take your spot. And your stuff, your finances, it could be here today and gone tomorrow. So we are trying to find an identity in things that are, that, are, that are transient, that don't last, that can go away. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves and that we have to answer is, is there something better I mean, is there somewhere that I can find my identity in something that will not change so I don't have to live in fear of losing it ever? And today, in week two of our series, Faith Under Fire, where we're looking at the letter of 1 Peter, we're, we're asking ourselves, how do we handle suffering? How do we handle you know, difficulty in a way that ignites our faith and it doesn't extinguish our faith? into a people whose faith is waning because they are facing difficulty and hardship and suffering. Peter turns them towards their identity. And he's telling them, if you want to know how to maintain hope and faith in the midst of suffering, it's whenever you remember who you are. This is the secret sauce to dealing with Difficulty. So 1 Peter chapter 2, if you've got your Bible or your notes, let's look through verses 4 through 10. I'm just going to read it all here, and then we'll walk through it um, as we, after we do that. So this is what Peter says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. He says this, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they don't obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you're not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people. Now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy. Now you have received God's mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, let's remember, let's remind ourselves who is writing this. So, it's the letter of 1 Peter. So, that means Peter is writing this letter. And uh, Peter, if you're not familiar with the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is a former fisherman. 
Um, he is a disciple of Jesus Christ. He is the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth, okay? Uh, his life motto is ready, fire, aim. That's just how Peter lived his life. Um, those of you who are brash and you speak before you think, he is your patron saint, all right? That, that's just who this guy, guy is. And um, there's a story in, in the Gospels to where um, Jesus has been ministering for a little bit, and he's with his 12 guys, and he asked them, who do you say that I am? Or actually, he starts off with this question. What are people saying about me? What's the word on the street about me? Who do people say I am? And they're like, well, some people are saying you're a prophet. Some people are saying you're John the Baptist back from the dead. You know, so there's a lot of great things being said about you, Jesus. But then Jesus asked them the question that everybody has to answer. And if you're in this room, if you're watching online, if you are breathing, at some point in life, you have to answer this question, and this is it. But who do you say I am? And Peter, ready, fire, aim, right? I mean, just immediately just blurts out, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, you know? And just bam, he just is like, just right out with it. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, good job, man. He's like, I've been with you for a little while, and I know you're not the sharpest in the bunch, um, and so I know that you didn't figure this out on your own. I know God gave you the answer to this, and you are correct. That is who I am. And then in verse 18, look at what, it says, what he says to him, because he gives him a new identity. He says, now I tell you that you are Peter. In other words, you're no longer Simon, but you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. And all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Now, here's what I want you to see from this short little interaction with Jesus and Peter. Is that as soon as Peter declared Jesus as Lord, Jesus declared who Peter was. So as soon as Peter recognized and declared Jesus to be who he was, that is whenever Jesus declares Peter who he is going to be. And so Peter is looking at this church that is dealing with suffering, they're dealing with difficulty, and he's going to do the exact same thing for the church. He's like, whenever you declare Jesus as Lord, he's saying to his church, Jesus declared something about you. And he's like, and I know things are tough. I know things are difficult right now. But if you're going to hang on and if you're going to make it through these fiery trials then you've got to remember what it is that Jesus said about you. And he goes straight to their identity, and he gives them four identity statements that we're going to look at today. Here's statement number one. It's this. You are strong. That's the first thing he says to the church. He's like, you're strong. He's like, you are living stones. He says, God is building his spiritual temple. What is Peter the rock saying to the church? He's like, y'all are rocks as well. You are strong. What does that mean? That means that you are meaningful and that you are stronger than you think you are. He quotes Psalm 118 uh, there. Uh, that's actually a really important psalm to understand. Six times in the New Testament, it is cited referring to Jesus that the stone, you know, the builders rejected. And it's vital for us to understand this. Don't miss this. That if Jesus Christ was rejected, then we can expect the same. Jesus even said this to his disciples. He's like, if they've done this to me, your Lord and your master, what do you think they're going to do to you as well? And if he was rejected, we can be, expect to be rejected as well. But here's the thing. People rejecting us because of Jesus doesn't determine our identity because it didn't determine Jesus' identity either. It doesn't matter. Because you are strong. You are a living stone. You are being built into his spiritual temple, built on the cornerstone, Jesus Christ himself. You are strong. Now, what was the purpose of the temple in the Old Testament? Well, it was always to be a place where people could meet God. That was the whole point of it. Well, as Christians, we don't have a physical temple uh, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, and since then, the people of God have been called the living stones, the living temple of God. And so listen to me, church, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you've got to hear me. You are a part of God's temple that is eternal, and you may not think that you're a big deal, but God does. In fact, turn to your neighbor right now and say, I don't know if you know this, but I'm kind of a big deal. All right, do that real quick, okay? <laughs> Just let them know. I'm kind of a big deal, kind of a big deal here, right? 
Because what does he call you? He calls you a living stone. Now, if you were to go over to Jerusalem and you were able to find one of the temple stones, they were massive, three foot long, eight foot high, four foot deep. So what does that mean? Do not miss this. God views you as a stone that is strong enough to build his church upon. That is how he sees you. And the reason this matters so much, do not miss this church, is if our world, if our community is going to meet God, it will be because of the people of God. You are strong. You are also holy. That's the second statement. You're holy. Now, you may not believe this, but God disagrees with you. If you go back a chapter to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, this is what Peter says to them. He says, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Now, we hear that, and we don't believe it. And we don't believe two things. One, that it's possible, or two, uh, that it's true. Because we start to think, well, I can't be holy because, well, I've been divorced, or I can't be holy because I struggle with addiction, or I I can't be holy because I can't control my kids. It just can't be true. But here's the thing, church. Holiness isn't what you do. It's what God declares. It's not what you do. It's what he declares. And that's what makes it both possible and true. And that's what our friend Mark Moore says. He says, holiness is received before it is achieved. You are holy. What does that mean? It means that you have been, literally, it means you have been set aside. You've been set apart. That's what the word holy means. And we all understand holiness because we all have items in our house that are holy. One of them is your toothbrush. (laughs) Right? Your your toothbrush is holy, right? Because it's set aside. Because what do you do is you set it aside on your sink and you only use it for one purpose, right? Somebody agree with me. You only use this for one purpose, right? <laughs> like, no, dude, I'm cleaning the grout, cleaning the sink, and then I'm brushing my teeth. I share it with my wife, share it with my dog. You know, we only have one toothbrush in the house and we just go around and do that. It's like, no, nobody does that. Why? Because it's set aside. It is holy. It it has a distinct purpose. In church, you are holy. You have been set aside. You have a distinct purpose that has been given to you by God. Why? Because you've been chosen. That's the third statement. You're chosen. You are a royal priest and a holy nation is what Peter says. I mean, I I think back to grade school and uh, PE, uh, those days whenever the coach would break us all off and he would get two captains up there. And it's like, we're going to play kickball, softball, dodgeball, flag football. It didn't really, really matter what it was. But do you remember how stressful that day was for somebody who was short, not quite athletic yet, kind of awkward and shy? And the entire time, you're just sitting there going, oh, please, don't let me be last. Don't let me be last. Don't let me be the one next to the kid that eats the boogers, and it's like between the two of us. It's like, oh, my gosh. Do you remember what prom season and homecoming season was like if you weren't in a dating relationship? And you're just going, oh, my goodness, I hope somebody will say yes. I hope somebody will ask me. I I, I just hope that, you know, I actually get a chance to be able to go to this thing. You ever done a job interview, and it's like, you need it, you need it, you need it, you need it, and you're just like waiting for the manager, you're waiting for the person to call and give you the words, you're hired? Really, at the core of it, that's not about kickball, it's not about a dance, it's not even really about a job. What is it that we want to hear more than anything? I choose you. You're worthy. I want you to be on my team. And what Peter is saying is you have been chosen. And so here's what you need to see is that it's our identity that leads to our belonging and it leads to our purpose. Who we are leads to where we fit and what we're here for. And so God has said this about you, that you do matter, that you matter so much. And he did choose you to be a royal priest in a holy nation. Now, in the Old Testament, there were three official positions, prophet, priest, and king. So a prophet was somebody who brought the word of God to the people of God. 
um, the priests represented the people to God, offering sacrifices, and then kings actually represented God and the people, and they held people accountable to live as God wanted them to live. But in Exodus, whenever everything is getting started with the nation of Israel, one of the things that God says to his people is, I want you to be a nation of priests. He's like, that's what I've created you to be, a nation of, of priests. He wanted people all over to have access to him, and he wanted his people to make that happen. And now here we are, and finally, through the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to do exactly what we were created to do all those years ago. We are his representatives. God's people have always been chosen to be shaped and to be sent, to be representatives of God himself to this world. Listen to me. You are a priest. And you're not just any priest. You are a royal priest. And so what that means is that we are not just doing everything we can to help people get to heaven, even though we're doing that. We are also doing everything we can to get heaven down to earth. And to bring as much heaven to this place as we can. Because you are royalty, you are chosen, and our job isn't just to help people get to heaven, but it is to bring as much heaven to this place as we possibly can. And here at Corinth, we take that seriously. And that's what we're trying to do. That's why if you were with us um, a few weeks ago, we did Feed My Starving Children, and over 500 people gathered in this room, and we packed over 101,000 meals to send off to 276 children in the world. And this week, I just happened to get the email, and I can tell you, our meals went to children in Uganda who are refugees in crisis. And we are feeding 276 children for an entire year in Uganda because of the efforts here. This is why whenever it comes down time to set our budget for the year, we are always setting aside and saying 15% is going to missions to be able to do as much as we can across this world. This is why we offer scholarships to people to go get counseling for the help that they need because we want them to be made whole. We take this seriously here. We're not just about getting people to heaven. We want to bring as much heaven to earth as we can can because we have been chosen to do that royal priests his representatives to this world and here's the last thing you are included you're strong you're holy you're chosen you're included verse 10 it says once you were not but now you are this is the declaration and one of the reasons why I love the local church so much is like it's great to be a part of something bigger than myself. It, it, is so much bigger, it is so much bigger than just me. It's so much bigger than just you as an individual. But whenever we all get together and whenever we are partnering with one another here in this community, we can make a difference. We're a part of something far bigger than ourselves. You're strong. You're holy. You're chosen. You're included. And friends, you've got to hold on to that identity with everything you have. Because whenever we know who we are, we know what to do. But here's the thing. I know that there's some of you watching online. There's some of you even in this room. I know the voices that you hear. And I know you hear the voices that you're not good enough, that you're a loser, you're, you're a bad dad, your family would be better off without you, you're all alone. Nobody loves you. You know, you're always going to struggle with this. There's no way out of this addiction. You've messed up way too much. No one is ever going to want you. You're a fraud. You're a disappointment. I, I know the voices that we hear. And here's the thing. If you believe a lie for long enough, you start to live as though that lie is true. And that's what causes us to get stuck. The old preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said this, Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? And then he says this, The chief cause of spiritual depression comes when we are listening to ourselves more than we are talking to ourselves. Who you are today is a result of your thoughts in the past. 
Who you will become in the future will be a result of what you think today. So what's the way out? The only, only way I know to tell you is this. you got to overwhelm the lies with the truth. Author Brennan Manning, he said it this way, define yourself radically as one beloved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is an illusion. God's love for you and his choice of you constitute your worth. Accept that and let it become the most important thing in your life. That new identity changes how you think about God, changes how you think about yourself, it even changes how you view others. It changes who you are. It changes who you feel. So who are you? You're strong. You are holy. You are chosen. And you are included. Why? Because you belong to Jesus Christ. And here's the bottom line. Whenever you declare Jesus as Lord, he'll make a declaration about you. He will make a de declaration about you as well. So here's my challenge to you this week. Is I want you to sign up for 21 days of daily devotions. Because one of the ways that we get through this is we overwhelm the lies with truth, and one of the ways we do that is to flood our mind with scriptures, to, to flood our mind with um, true thoughts from the Word of God. And so we have set up a way for you to get 21 days in a row of daily devotion. So let's go ahead and throw the next slide up there. Um, this is how you can sign up for it. you got two ways to do this. You can, if you know how to do a QR code, you can scan the QR code. It'll take care of it for you. If you don't know how to do a QR code, um, then text to this number on the screen, 833-338-6616. It's right there. It's going to stay on the screen until I say amen, all right? So it's going to stay up there. Um, just text the word identity to that number. And then tomorrow, you will begin receiving uh, devotions, 21 days of daily devotions, just short little thoughts to help you focus in on who it is that God says you are. Why? Because when you know who you are, you know what to do, right? And it's our identity. That's where we find all of our gr grounding. So sign up for this, and you'll start getting those tomorrow. So let's leave that slide up here, but let me just kind of wrap things up here. And I want to take you back to Peter's story. And I want to take you to the beginning of Peter's story, one of the first times we meet him. After a long night of fishing, Jesus um, gets in the boat with them, and he's like, hey, let's go out into the water for a little bit. And, and they, haven't, they haven't caught anything. Like, they caught nothing. It was just one of those nights, otherwise known as fishing, and that they were just like <laughs> out there, nothing, nothing at all going on. And Jesus gets them out there, and he says, hey, um, why don't you throw your net on the other side of the boat? And... Peter's a professional fisherman, right? And I'm, he, this isn't in the Bible, but I'm sure this is what he thought was, hey, preacher, um, why don't you say to preach and I'll say to fishing? And I kind of know what it is. You know, I have probably tried the other side of the boat at least seven different times tonight. Um, but hey, but this is what Peter says. He doesn't say that part out loud. What he says out loud is this. You know, but, but because you say so, I'll do it. Throws the net out to the other side, and he throws it out there, and I'm sure that he's pretty skeptical about it, but all of a sudden, he feels the net starting to just go down, and he's just like, oh my goodness, what is going on? I mean, veins are popping out in the forearms. I mean, it's, the neck is starting to just like strain. He's yelling at his buddies, y'all got to get over here, because it's like every single fish that was in the lake just decided it was going to jump into that net. I mean, they can barely get that thing into the boat without it capsizing, and at the very end of that, you would think a fisherman who has just caught the largest catch of fish that he's ever caught that he would just be celebrating, going nuts, and, being, and just being like so excited because like how much money is all in the boat now? But that is not what Peter does. Do you remember what Peter does? As he looks at Jesus and he says, you got to get away from me, depart from me because I am a sinful man. He tries to push him away. So many people think that God won't accept them until they clean up their life first. And you may believe that before you can come to Jesus, you need to clean up your life, and then you can make him, him Lord. And you've been saying to Jesus for a long time, you got to depart from me. I'm still a sinner. I, I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful woman. But I, I just want to tell you this. The problem with that is you're 
it's backwards thinking. You're not thinking straight, my friend. Because do you realize that you will never get your life in order without Jesus Christ in your life in the first place? I mean, how are you going to get your life in order without the power of Jesus Christ living in you in the first place? And the answer is you can't. You cannot do it. So you don't need to tell Jesus today, you depart from me because I am a sinful person. You need to tell him this, I am a sinner and I need your help. That's where you go today. And whenever you do that, he, when you declare him as Lord, he's going to make a declaration about you. And that's when you're going to get to hear that you are strong, you are holy, you are chosen, and you are, in, you are included. And if you have never said to Jesus that he is Lord, do not put off to tomorrow what you should do today. And you say to him, I need your help. If you're watching online and you're ready to say that to Jesus, that I, I need your help, I want you to visit the website that's on the screen right now and say you're ready to begin a relationship with Jesus. If you're in the room and you know that that's what you need to do, I want you to grab a connection card, one of the seat back cards, and say that you're ready to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ because you will never experience the change that you're looking for until you make him Lord of your life. So fill that card out, hand it to an usher, and let's, let's get this moving. And let's receive a brand new identity. So, Father God, today we thank you that you are a God who calls us to yourself and that you have given us an identity that cannot be taken from us. For my friends that need to make a decision today, I pray, God, that they would not put off to tomorrow what they need to do today. They would declare you as Lord and receive the declarations that you will make about them. Uh, Father, we pray that all of us who are, who are walking with you, that we would walk out of here understanding clearly who it is that you say that we are and that it has nothing to do with how great we are but of how incredible you are. And we pray that in your wonderful name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.